Well, good morning, everyone. All right. So thanks for joining us on this Wednesday morning. My name is Benjamin Neely. I'm the Executive Director of the Burbs History Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to our auditorium here at the museum. Uh, also, we have folks joining us uh, remotely online or at home. So uh, I welcome them as well. Uh, I know I saw the registration. We have lots of members in the room. I really appreciate your membership. And thank you for coming out here. If you're not a member and you you'd like to become one, we can take care of that for you today out in the lobby. We can get you all set up here. Uh, we have lots of programs like this. So we even have one coming up this Saturday. And it is Pontiac's Rebellion Comes to Berks County, presented by one of our fellow trustees here, Brian Englehart. So that'll be at 10 a.m. back here in the auditorium on this Saturday. I uh, would like to... Um, thank the Heidelberg Heritage Society uh, for helping uh, us have this program here this morning. And with that, I'll introduce our main event here. Uh, we are joined by Jeff O'Connor, and he is here to talk about the Palatine sentiment in the land of the turtles. And so if you please help me welcome Mr. O'Connor. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the Berks County History Center for hosting and our uh, host for uh, handling a little technical curveball this morning. Um, much appreciated. And also welcome to the folks watching this remotely. Um, now, where this comes from and where we get to is here uh, in Berks County. Uh, but to get there, we have to go through the Schoharie Valley first. And that's... Uh, why I, uh, part of the reason why I wrote what was one huge volume. Um, uh, unfortunately, Square Valley history had to be redone also. Uh, so anyway, um, I've got, I had to break up this huge volume into three more easily digested volumes to get to this point where we get to Palatine through Square Valley and finally to uh, the Tulpahawk region. Um, so, um, Without further ado, let me, uh, let me uh, just want you to know where Schoharie County is, where the Schoharie Valley is. Uh, for those of you that rather ignore New York for different reasons. Um, but anyway, um, New York in the red there is Schoharie County. And um, where that is on this map, just give you an idea about where it's located uh, for those here. Mohawk River is right here, Hudson River right here, and the Spohari Creek is here. These are really the three great colonial uh, waterways uh, of New York, uh, almost right up to the Revolution. And where this ends up, one of the uh, uh, theses of this uh, series is really how rapidly the uh, New York frontier expanded. Uh, once the Palatines arrived in the Scoberi Valley, it really started it. Um, and of course, part of that expansion of New York is the exodus of quite a few families from the Scoberi Valley to Topahawken. Uh, so as we see for, at uh, 1614 is uh, Nassau, uh, later, for, uh, later moved to Albany, Fort Orange. And 1661, it goes about 12 or 13 miles inland to Schenectady. Um, and that's where it stays for almost another 50 years. So within 100 years, with the Palatines finally moving into the Schoharie Valley, it took 100 years to go about 30 to 40 miles, depending on where the creek is. Pretty slow colonization. Um, I, I won't bore you with some of those details, but they are listed in the uh, earlier volumes. And then, of course, by 1723, when the Palatines start uh, uh, leaving the Schoharie Valley, it moves it another 40 or so miles uh, to the west and makes possible Fort Oswego out here in 1725. So you can see a very rapid movement, and that's where it is really headed um, with the uh, end of the series. So with that said, I just want to briefly talk about uh, Volume 1. Um, this is mostly Schoharie Valley history, but I'll let you read on, the, um, on here rather than explain everything. Uh, but the point here is, is that there was a history of the Schoharie Valley before the Palatines. And in locally in the Schoharie uh, Valley area, uh, very little of it, if anything, was known. 
So where volume one ends up is the first attempt to purchase Schoharie uh, Valley land. Many things go into why it took until 1686 um, with the first petition uh, to get it, what's called an Indian license in 1686. Uh, this person did not get it. Uh, he did not obtain it. Uh, possibly the Mohawks weren't ready to sell it um, or possibly somebody in the political realm interceded. Uh, but one thing as far as local Schoharie Valley people go, uh, this is the first attempted sale. It was listed as somebody named Andrew Brown. That is not his name. That's why everybody's research stopped there. It's actually Andrew Bounty. And just to wrap his career up, he almost became the first governor of the United New Jersey uh, province. Um, so he was a very good political person. He was in New York, very uh, small amount of time. And he made an impact as far as Schoharie Valley history goes as the person who could have been the founder of Schoharie Valley. Uh, volume two uh, starts with the Glorious Revolution, Leesler's Rebellion. I'm not going to get into everything here, but Nicholas Bayard becomes a very important person in the story, um, mainly because he is the first person to actually own Schoharie Valley land, except it became fraudulent and it exposed this huge um, controversy with the Mohawks about what was called the extravagant grants. Uh, these were, um, you know, Schoharie Valley was 30 to 40 miles from the mouth down past the uh, what you'll be familiar with is Roman's nose. And um, uh, he lost it. Patton got vacated. And one of the reasons why it was still there when the Palatines arrived here is because it was in legal limbo until the Queen, until Queen Anne actually confirmed it in 1708. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of that story also. But more importantly, um, shortly after that land fraud, uh, I'm saying about 1702, give or take, uh, Mohawks returned to the Schoharie Valley after about a century of the vacancy. Um, till that point, it was about 9,000 years of continuous occupation. Um, <clears throat> so it's important that the Mohawks arrive because the Mohawk people are the ones who are there to greet the Palatines and help them, um, as we'll get into. Um, this is the view from the Onisagrawa, as they would call it, uh, sometimes known as Corn Mountain. And this is overlooking their village, um, at least one of them when the Palatines arrived. And just so you know where Schoharie, Schoharie comes from, traditional, it's, a, it's driftwood uh, that collected where three, uh, two creeks came in into Schoharie uh, Creek right around where we're looking at now. Uh, the most recent uh, Mohawk translation today, if you ask them, it comes from Ioskahire, which is cleansing. They actually put mud all over themselves to take the and when they wash it off, it takes the toxins away from them. So what it is is a place of healing. So it's very sacred uh, to Mohawk people. So that's kind of bringing you up volumes one and two very quickly. There's a whole lot of information, not just about the Scoberry Valley, but all of the things, all of the people that are connected to it. And the way I approach this, it's kind of like it's a it's a series about the Palatines. That's not really about the Palatines. It's about the Schoharie Valley. But the Palatines play a huge critical role in its history. And that's why Volume 3 uh, is almost exclusively of Palatines and the relationships they have. But another thing that I, the uh, path that I took with, these, with this series was that it's really um, in the absence of information, which there's only two land attempts that are documented. That's it for the Schoharie Valley in the 17th century. Um, but in the absence of that in archaeology uh, uh, evidence, it's just the people who are connected to it in different ways. And that's where the true story really comes out. Because the way I approached it is when people were important to the Schoharie Valley story, which also means it's important to the Palatine story, um, you get introduced to them early on in their career. So when they first enter the evidence, and we follow them throughout so that by the time the Palatines arrive, you know a lot of the people involved where, you know, like Robert Livingston, Robert Hunter, um, Adam Vroman, all these folks that are involved in the uh, in other ones that you might not even know about um, in the story. You get to know them because for them, the Palatine story was kind of an interruption of their lives where normally the Palatine story is talked about as, you know, they're. 
they're kind of look, they're looking for their promised land, but everybody else is either there to either help them or interfere with them. But here you get kind of a more round, full picture of the people that are involved and the people you expect to be, let's just say, not above board might not turn out to be that way. Um, but on the other hand, you might go, oh, that wasn't a good idea from a certain person. So that said, let's talk about volume three, because that's what I know most folks here are interested in. Um, so volume three begins uh, with the War of the Spanish Succession. And these three lovely folks here, uh, Queen Anne in the middle, and you have uh, uh, Sarah, the Duchess of York on our left, and John, uh, Duke, uh, John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough. Um, this is a very interesting triumvirate, most powerful people, most likely, uh, in Europe at the time. Um, but they, they play off each other because Sarah is very close to the Queen and the Duke of Marlborough especially on this campaign, uh, the March to the Danube, meaning Blenheim campaign, he can almost do anything he wants, which means he's in a perfect position when he's called upon to help the Palatines. He's in a perfect position to do so. Uh, but one of the reasons why I follow this particular uh, campaign in uh, uh, volume three is, first of all, the Duke of Marlborough's uh, opinions about the Palatinate. He has quite a bit to, or not, I want to say quite a bit, but he is um, just stunned by the landscape and the people. Um, he thinks it's just a beautiful place as he's staying with the Elector Palatine, uh, looking over the, uh, the lower Palatine, because they march right through it. But another reason why I follow this is because you get to know Colonel Robert Hunter quite a bit. Now, Hunter is either looked at as kind of a helper in the beginning and then somewhat of a uh i don't want to i don't want to say evil but let's just say his decisions make it possible or force the Pal palatines to make decisions of their own uh, so robert hart we get to know him beforehand he's a decorated dragoon officer uh he is one of uh marlboro's close aides in fact he considers uh marlboro considers a part of his military family uh, but he also has a falling out with Marlborough also, which puts him on the outside, uh, which eventually leads to his uh, appointment as uh, governor of Virginia. He gets captured. And when he's released, uh, Marlborough finally relents and says, yes, he would make a good governor of New York. Um, so as we get into the Palatine story itself, uh, this is the extravagant grants I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> the... One of the Mohawk uh, River is about 50 miles long. It's never surveyed, by the way. Um, Schoharie, you can see as it drops down, it's about 30 to 40 miles. And then that very long one up in the north, that is uh, Lake Champlain and Point South. That's over 70 miles long that, that uh, folks actually got a patent, or I should say an Indian deed, and then a patent later. And it turns out every one of these was fraudulent uh, as the uh, complainants. Henry and Joseph say for the Schoharie Valley, which is the first one complained about, um, they say that um, uh, they had six drunken idol uh, of, of their people sign the deed, and that's how the deed was obtained, and then a patent, and this is Nicholas Bayard's uh, patent on the Schoharie right here, and um, <clears throat> his quit rent, which was kind of like a tax, was one otter skin per, per annum. 30 or 40 miles. The only reason why they don't know is because they never surveyed it. The way the boundary is, it's about 40 miles from the mouth all the way down past uh, what is now uh, Middleburg uh, today. Uh, so it was very large pack, probably two or three miles on each side. Um, certainly not 10,000 acres that was on the pack, um, but it's very large and it was just considered a fraudulent patent. And the one I haven't really talked about is this one here. Uh, down on the Hudson, it belonged to a Captain Evans. Um, that was also vacated. All of these were vacated, meaning they never happened in uh, 1899. Except the problem is they needed uh, the king or queen in order to confirm it because it was an act of assembly. They had to confirm it to make it law. So what happens is in 1702, the state is, or the provincial assembly of New York actually reverses the first one. So now you have an act of assembly that says they're vacated, they're not, no, never happened, 
And then the other one saying they're reinstated. But so far, the King or King William first and Queen Le Anne later had confirmed anything. So that's what makes this uh, these grants uh, in legal limbo. You can't sell anything. There's nothing you can do until 1708 when uh, Reverend Cotterthal brought over those first 51 people. They went through England, uh, went over to Passaic Creek, which is uh, modern day Newburgh. And the reason why they went there is because Queen Anne confirmed the first, don't worry, there's not a test afterwards, but they confirmed the first one, um, act of assembly that vacated all these extravagant grants. So Cotterthal's people had a place to go. Before this, there was not much land to, to grant them. And where they went was that lower uh, grant around Newburgh. So that started the Palatine movement associated with the 1710 arrival. And once Cotterthal gets over there in 1708, he is a um, self-proclaimed reverend. He goes to England back and forth. And by 1709, he's in England. He actually left um, his people behind and they were not doing well. Uh, they needed food, they needed assistance, and they were starving. Um, so somebody who's, who came in to help them was Nicholas Bayard, the one who lost the Scohair patent, probably because he was told, well, the reason why you lost it is because it would be too hard to settle it. You own all the land. How are we going to get people on there? So maybe this was his way of getting back in and making another claim on his patent, which he never gave up on, by the way. He continued doing it, including uh, with his son, Samuel. So here we have uh, the pathway from not only the Palatinate, but surrounding principalities. Um, of course, the 1707-1708 campaign by Marshal Villers out of France um, just devastated uh, parts of the Rhine and their tributaries in the lower Palatinate, Wurttemberg, uh, Hesse Castle, and other places. They stayed there almost a year. Uh, and while they were there, they were desecrating and destroying uh, anything of, uh, that was German. And they didn't care. Now, these are Catholic. This is really a Catholic Protestant war really get down to it. Uh, but even though you know, there were Catholics in the Palatinate surrounding um, uh, principalities, French didn't care. They treated them the same way as everybody else. So you can't really say it's a religious movement to come here other than the broad scope of Catholic versus Protestant. Uh, so now you see the, the route to, uh, uh, the uh, to Bel uh, I'm sorry, to Holland and to Rotterdam. Now, of course, Reverend Cotterthal is the one who uh, created this pamphlet with Queen Anne's image on it, saying how great it was coming over to the new world and Queen Anne's going to help you and everybody's going to give you money and help along the way on the Rhine, which is all well and good for 51 people. But when you have 15,000, 17,000 uh, people coming down the Rhine, not everybody has a coin for you. Not everybody has food for you. And even though there really wasn't any theft or piracy along the way, at least not that I could find, I'm sure it was, it was more legal piracy where prices were higher, they, everything cost more. So it was a burden for people to go, but they really didn't have a choice. Because when Villers went through, he destroyed farms and farmland, just like the revolution and all the frontier places uh, in New York, Pennsylvania and other places. Um, so they didn't have a choice. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't sow their uh, uh, winter wheat. So, which means in the spring of 1709, they had no, win no wheat. Um, and of course, when that happens, you don't have bread. That's a staple of their diet. Um, and bread was so scarce, they couldn't afford it. However, even though they got destroyed, their farms are destroyed. People are dying of disease. That's what happens after these kinds of raids. And people are dying because they're not, they don't have nutrition. What happens is, is that they still have to pay their taxes to the feudal manor. That is a huge burden. Many people thought it was time to take a new route. And what Cotterthal's, um, you know, the, the golden book, as it's sometimes called, what it did is give them a, a pathway because they kind of ignored pamphlets before from Pennsylvania, William Penn and others. Um, but this one, after all of this, it gave them a pathway. It gave them a way to go. So what do they do? They go to Rotterdam, get on ships. Wonderful. Nobody knew they were coming. Um, the, um, 
ambassador to the Hague for England, had no idea what to do with them. Um, but so they started just kind of accumulating around Rotterdam and shanties. And that's where the Duke of Marlborough uh, steps in after being asked, what am I going to do? Uh, this ambassador named Dayroll sent a couple of waves of ships. But they just kept coming and coming. I don't know what to do with these folks. Marlborough said, you know what? We're going to put them on military transports. When they come off and, and uh, disembark all of the provisions and supplies, we're going to send the Palatines on military ships over to England. And somehow we'll deal with it. Now, he is with, he's kind of like a Whig reformer. Um, and those were the Whigs, the reformers. They wanted to take care of people like this. But there were so many people in England who were now in the service, now marching in continental, Uni uh, in continental Europe. They go, well, maybe these folks can make good farmers out in the countryside. So they decided to bring them over. And what this is, is a nice uh, image of St. Catherine's Docks right next to the Tower of London, where these waves would disembark. Problem is nobody's there to help them. So in the coffee houses, there's two men, uh, Duparte, Duparte and Trebeco, uh, who are doctors, and they take it upon themselves to take care of each wave. Each wave had 700, 900 people on it. Um, so at first that was it until about July when Queen Anne finally got um, her whole cabinet, her uh, privy council, everybody who's anybody, involved in taking care of the Palatines. And that's when uh, this is uh, London to the north of the river. And down here, you got Deptford uh, the rope yards here. You got Cam uh, not Camberwell, but the Blackheath and Camberwell's over here. Um, that's where they encamped. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Let's just say they weren't welcomed by a lot of people especially by the Tory government who looked at them as scapegoats for all, all ills for England. They're going to take their jobs, that kind of thing. And meanwhile, they're entertaining anybody that comes into the camps with toys and, and whatnot. And there was at least one incident when um, the Englanders, poor for the most part, came in with clubs and there was a bit of a melee there. Um, but while they were at the camps, the traditional story is, I'm sorry, I'm going to break a lot of myths today. Uh, but today, um, the big myth is that there were four Indian chiefs, Mohawks. Uh, one of them was a river Indian, but let's let's make it simple. Um, they were Mohawk chiefs, varying degrees, whether they're village chiefs, clan chiefs, really didn't matter. Uh, what they were were hand selected by Peter, uh, Colonel Peter Schuyler of Albany. And what he wanted was to have chiefs who might be able to speak English who he could present to the royalty um, and also impress to bring back word, most importantly, that England is so powerful that we can win this war, but you can help us do it by joining a, an expedition against Canada. Now, these four kings, the most important one here is the one on the right, and that is, uh, he's called King Hendrick. Uh, but Hendrick was the, the Henry that complained about the fraudulent land sale in the Scoberry Valley, and his name's going to come up uh, several times. Now, the, the thing of this story is, is that they never met the Palatines in the camps. This is the tradition. They met them in the camps, took pity on them, say, we have land for you out in the Scoberry Valley. Never happened. In fact, the Palatines came to New York, and from that stock came, uh, many of them came to Topahawken, were already on ships around Christmas of 1709. The chiefs did not leave Boston until February of 1710. They arrived at Portsmouth, Har Har Portsmouth Harbor in April. Now, also in April were the Palatine Wonder Fleet. They were waiting for uh, the new governor, Hunter, who's taking over for the previous governor who died. And he's the one who put the pa these Palatines under contract, about 3,000 of them, put them on ships, and from Christmas until about April, uh, early April, they were on the southern coast of England waiting for Governor Hunter to get his affairs in order and also get last instructions from the Queen and her council about what they're going to do in the New World. So they were on ships for almost for a little over four months. They're already dying here. They all got typhus. And the, and the most ironic part of this whole story is, those, in, those Mohawk chiefs and the Palatines were at Portsmouth Harbor for a couple of days. They never met, and it's a good thing, because one of those proofs why they, it didn't happen is because the chiefs survived. 
Palatines were sick the entire time they were in England as a whole. Um, and certainly in Portsmouth, they were already dying and had typhus uh, rampant through the ships now, which is a rodent-borne disease, uh, horrible disease. Um, and a lot of people were already starting on their way to dying across the uh, Atlantic. But we'll get into the, the real uh, thing that happened there. Okay, so what was it like on a ship? Gives you a very quick um, idea, except went way more packed than what you see here. Ship's holds were low and they were uh, dark and dank, uh, certainly not a good, uh, healthy environment. And this is where many people uh, died on the way. <clears throat> Come on. Okay, uh, where did they end up? <laughs> this is a modern photograph, obviously is Governor's Island, uh, because the Dutch in New York City, this is after a couple of months, first uh, ship that arrives is June 14th. In a rough way, uh, they're on Governor's Island because the Dutch in New York City just did not uh, want these sickly Palatines in the city. It, was, it, was, it would have caused a plague. So they were put on Governor's Island. 470 people died along the way. Uh, another 250 uh, I believe, died on Governor's Island by the boards that were made for coffins. Um, so it was horrible. And then, they, of course, they get separated out. They're divided in companies. The healthy go to just, pa just uh, past the, the wall, which would be Wall Street today, but the stockade, into the New York Common. And once they were all there and healthy, divided into six companies. So at that point, the Palatines are essentially in the um, uh, groups that would eventually be in the same villages. And then from those villages in the camps, uh, go to Schoharie. Um, but it's kind of a military operation. When you start thinking about the Palatine movements, when they get on their own and into a military operation, things kind of fall into place. So what was New York like in 1710 when they arrived? The, uh, the settlements were along the Hudson from New York City uh, to Esophis, Albany. You had Rensselaerwick in here, Schenectady, not quite Schoharie yet. However, there were Mohawks living there and also on the Mohawk uh, Valley. That's it. That frontier is Schenectady at this point. Now, while Hunter and the Palatines were in New York City, Governor Hunter sent out surveyors to the Schoharie, Mohawk, Hudson Valleys to find where the proper trees would be for this naval store operation that he put all of these uh, palatines under, which are now only about 2,200 after all the deaths. Uh, orphans and other children who only had one parent were about 85 of them were apprenticed out um, to uh, different uh, businessmen in uh, Long Island mostly. Um, so when Hunter was in uh, New York City, as they were, as the palatines were recuperating. He sent out these surveyors. The Mohawks prevented the surveyors twice from uh, surveying Schoharie Mohawk Valleys because they didn't have permission. Hunter just sent them out there. Eventually, the Mohawks relented and allowed them to survey, and um, they were very angry about it, though, um, and actually uh, accused uh, Governor Hunter and the Assembly, New York in general, that, you know, when the chiefs went out to London, they were supposed to bring thousands of men here to win the war against France. And then they're now they're complaining in, re, in I'm paraphrasing, in reality, they sent 10 men to take all the Mohawk land away from them. That's what they were thinking about at this point. Relations were not good. Um, so um, when uh, King, uh, I don't want to call him King, it's Hendrick, Mohawk chief. When he, when he came back from England and found out what Hunter had done, now, mind you, if the story was true about them seeing the Palatines in England, this never would have happened, is what I'm about to tell you. Hendrick came back uh, in early August, and he went uh, back home in the Mohawk Valley just long enough to hear what had happened. He was incensed. He couldn't believe it. And one of the things about Hendrick that I attribute to, he is, I look at him as the protector of the Schoharie Valley. And anything that affects the Schoharie Valley, he's going to be either upset about uh, agree with or be against. In this case, 
He could not stand the fact that Governor Hunter had sent out those surveyors. So in a meeting, August 22nd, 1710, in Albany, not England, Hendrick got up to speak in a, in a private council with uh, Hunter and said, I'm going to paraphrase, you, had no, you did not have permission to send surveyors out to the, into uh, Scohair. <clears throat> and that is the way Mohawk diplomacy works. He didn't yell at him, but he made his point very clear up here. But then he came down low with the offer because he couldn't stay, you know, the, the relationship between the New York governor and the Mohawks and the Haudenosaunee, people call them five nations at this time, the Iroquois, is critical to the English um, uh, colonization effort. They have a covenant chain started in 1777 or 1677 that connects with a very highly polished chain as the Mohawks call uh, the Haudenosaunee, the colonies in England, all trade alliance, military alliance. It's a very strong alliance. They can't afford to break it. So Hendricks comes with a, with a low ball. We'll give Queen Anne the use of the land for the Christians, meaning the Palatines. We reserve this flat or plain um, at the base, uh, at uh, the Onus de Garawa, where we still plant corn. So they're reserving part of the Scoheri Valley for themselves, but otherwise they say, we'll give it to Queen Anne because she can settle the Palatines here. This is in America, in Albany. Well, Hunter was never going to allow Palatines who had nothing to have good arable land. What was known was that it would be very good um, farming land if it ever got improved. There's no road out there. There's no way to get there. And if somebody was to do that, it would be very good land. So that's what's known. So here we have that fall in 1710, Governor Hunter purchases land in Livingston Manor and, uh, and also across the, uh, the creek to set up these naval store camps. Right here is where the camps would be next to the Hudson River. Uh, Livingston's house and manor would be up here. And then he has several buildings in here with his business, businesses, which would be milling. Uh, he's got an alehouse. He's one of the few men, actually, that Governor Hunter can turn to who could provide the logistics needed to keep 2,200 people alive with beer and bread. That's the contract they made. So the naval store operation, and here are the, uh, here are the, uh, the, the, camps as they were set out, four on one side, or four on one side, three on the other, or eventually eight. Uh, but anyway, the naval store camps were important because it was going to be cheaper. That was the idea. It would be cheaper than getting it from Scandinavia, which is under Russian control, yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to get into this big thing. But the key here is, is that it would take two full years from the point of stripping the trees of bark in a certain way to leave a certain amount of bark in a certain direction. Two full years of seeding, seasons, meaning two seasons each, revolution, before you could take them down, cut them down, and burn them for tar in that, so you don't have to cut down the whole tree, you're just cutting down the part. And then you burn it for tar, you could get resins from it. Uh, it would take two years. So the Palatines arrive in the fall of 1710, they make their makeshift houses, plots of 60 by 40 that includes their gardens. Um, and then through the winter, they're basically idle. It's the most comfortable they've been in a long time now, a couple of years now. Um, so some of these Palatines go to Albany and they um, are part of the garrison duty. So of course, if you want to know where they found out about land for them in Scoheri Valley, start there. They would have learned about it from there. And Mohawks are coming and going out of Albany all the time. And they would have learned it from there. So how come you're not out in the Scoheri Valley? They would have asked questions. You know, they didn't just let things go. They knew what was going on in the province. And they traveled a lot. So in 1711, one of the things that they're already starting to ask Governor Hunter about this land in Scoheri, it's not in 1710, it's in 1711 after some of these garrison members come back. So then they start asking Governor Hunter about you know, what's going on? Why can't we go to the school here? Why can't we go there? Well, first of all, you're under a contract. Number two, I said so. Number three, I said so, because he's very imperialistic, um, even though he's very erudite as far as his intelligence goes. Um, he's part of the uh, Augustans, which are poets and science and 
literature. They're very uh, highly educated. Uh, even that, he's very imperialistic. So one of the things he says, though, that the Palatines really hang on to is, I can't send you out. There's no protection for you. There's no, there's no forts. I can't put a garrison out there. Hunter himself only has about two companies of men, of regulars, under his control in Albany. That's it. Everything else is down in New York City. So that said, when an expedition to Canada, that one that the Chiefs went to England to go see the power of England in order to join up on, which they did before this, they're neutral. Um, in 1711, Palette, about 300 go to on the expedition with a, with a specific purpose is if they beat the French in Canada, then it's safe to go to this place called Squahira, which none of them had seen yet. It just sounds like the promised land to them. So that's why they go. It gets aborted right around um, Lake George, and it turns back. So after that, the, uh, the men who come back, they are uh, come back to a situation where their women and uh, their wives and other women and children their families, they're not being fed well. The uh, quality of the meat is going downhill. In fact, all the quality is going downhill at all because they were fed on the way up. And it doesn't look like anybody really tried to take care of their families when they before they got back. Uh, so already there's signs that things aren't going well. But in that spring before they left, they stripped 100,000 uh, of these pitch pine trees. It's a very specific pitch pine that they would be able to harvest in two years. Remember, it's the spring of 1711. Now, when they come back, things aren't going well. They start talking about going to school here. They want the contract read to them again. They are rebellious with Governor Hunter. They gather up uh, their guns that they still had from being uh, uh, made militia, basically, back in New York City. They, they go, they try to get Governor Hunter to agree with what they're telling him. He says, bugger off, tries to head him off with the soldiers that he does have. There's all kinds of rebellion. But the key of this whole thing is when they look west, what they saw was this, Catskill Mountains. They knew somewhere over there Spohera was. So every sunset that went over those mountains, they could look at it and go, I, we need to get over there, we need to get over there. And it just starts that process of wanting to get out of what they considered a bad situation. Um, and that bad situation by the fall of 1712, the situation was the Tory government takes over in 1711 in England. They don't want to prop up this naval store uh, operation at all. So <clears throat> Governor Hunter is keeping up his own credit. When that runs out, he starts using his own cash. But when that runs out, he's afraid that if he loses his office, he's going to be arrested as a debtor. The one thing he never did, though, was, you know, he says, well, I'll get, I'll get land for you, Palatines. You could, you could farm. I'll get you land. And he never asked him what really good land was. The same land that where his pine trees are is not good farming. land. So Governor Hunter, who's probably never farmed in his life, is trying to tell them what good land is. They knew better. And that's what they chafed them a lot. Uh, so by 1712, Governor Hunter's money runs out. And uh, he tells them to shift for themselves. Well, they remember, they heard it from the Mohawks and probably others. You know, there's land out there. Mohawks have land out there. It's still here for you. Okay, well, let's check it out. One of the first things they would do, what the first things they saw was this mountain called Terrace Mountain today. Uh, natives called it Wonkitsieno. And uh, the, the German Palatines would call it um, Klippa or Clippin, traditional Clippin, Clipperberg. It's really Clipperberg, and it just means rocky. So does one kid Sienna. It's rocky, it's in a mountain. So it all makes sense. They saw this, they saw the valley, um, and they just knew that oh, this would be a good place to go. And once they did that, they come back, report, and families start saying, yes, I want to move out there. Now, um, one of the things that happens is that young man Conrad Weiser, who was in uh, the uh, motivator, instigator, however way you want to describe him, he is motivating people to leave and go to Scohir. The first 50 families he's able to convince go to Schenectady. They build a road, um, <clears throat> which I'll talk about in a second, but they build a, or not build, I should say, clear a road from Schenectady to the Scoheri Valley. But at the same time, uh, by November, there's a new missionary going out to the Mohawks, Reverend uh, William Andrews. And as he's going by Schenectady, he's being escorted by Mohawks. And Hendrick is there also. Um, 
And uh, Johann Conrad Weiser goes, I want my son to go with you to the Mohawk country. He needs to learn the language. He needs what, what Weiser needs is an interpreter. He knows he's going somewhere where he needs to be at the head of everything. So who better than his, um, at this time, 16-year-old um, son, He's just young enough to be impressionable, but not old enough to be set in his ways. It's a perfect age to learn a new Lloyd language and culture. That's exactly what he does. What this is, is the Mohawk River um, up top. And it is the real name of the Schoharie Creek. Schoharie is actually a, a place on the Schoharie Creek. Hyanderoves, or in this way, Ferondorogo uh, Creek is what the Schoharie Creek was called at this time. Um, and also there was a Mohawk uh, village here. And then there's also Fort Hunter by 1712. So uh, Conrad Weiser Jr. goes with the Mohawks. He's at that, what was later known as the Lower Castle. He learns the language and the culture. And while he's there, the, ro the road has already been erected. Uh, but that's not why the road is made. The road is made so that in the spring, Johann Conrad Weiser stays behind in Schenectady as the other 50 families go to the Schoharie Valley um, in the fall of 1712. He's behind acting like a commissary. So if you look at it as a military operation, you have the advanced um, poor going out to scout out, find a place. And during the winter, they're going to be looking for mill, uh, milling type creeks. They're going to look for places for water, uh, find out what kind of hunting there is. But they can't really communicate with the natives there yet. So they're kind of on their own. All they have is corn uh, cornmeal with them. So Weiser is going to be beg, uh, begging and borrowing everything he can on credit, loan, uh, just charity, whatever he can get, because it's important that the road was already there before the winter came. So once winter allowed, whether it's in the middle of winter, after winter, when that is clear enough for wagons to be sent forth, um, not only from Schenectady, but also from churches, who helped send it to Albany and then on to Schenectady. This is why the road is there. It's not the walk uh, into the Schoharie Valley. And speaking of roads, like I said, I'm gonna blow a bunch of myths. This is a Palatine road sign. Maybe you can't read, read it very well. It says, first road west by German refugees to Schoharie Valley. Okay, this is out toward uh, Gilderland. I don't expect you folks to know where that is, but maybe you do. Okay, so there's two roads that the Palatines build. One from Schenectady up here to the Schoharie Valley. Now, this is at the time of the Revolution, but the roads were the same. It's the same road you're looking at. So that's number one. Number two is this road that eventually goes between Schenectady and Albany. This is where that sign I just showed you is. Uh-oh, we got a problem, right? We got a wrong sign. Won't be the first one I'm going to show you. First one was up here. First road, not this one. The sign I just showed you about being the first road in Schoharie, to the Schoharie Valley is incorrect. All right, let's see what else is incorrect. Traditionally, the story is, is that uh, Johann Conrad Weiser or his followers, the first settlement that was uh, created was at Middleburg in the Schoharie Valley. And the sign that's there says first settlement in Squarey County founded 1712-1713 by John C. Weiser. It's the right sign. The problem is it's in the wrong place. Let me explain. Brunendorf was actually the first settlement. Conrad Weiser Jr. has the only documented, um, any document that actually says what the dwarfs were and where they were. Everything else is secondary um, uh, uh, secondary uh, information. It's in like folklore. It's not documented. It's not even on maps. You won't find Dorf on a map. It's all anglicized to town. So when Conrad Weiser Jr. says um, the Dorfs, um, traditionally what they say is from the south to the north. This is local history. Weiser's Dorf to the south, then Hartman's Dorf about a mile or two north of that, then Brunendorf another mile or two north of that, then you have Schmitzdorf, about a mile of that. Foxesdorf, a mile of that. And I'll give you a nice map here in a second. And then you have Gerlachsdorf, a mile of that. And then Niskernsdorf at the, uh, at the northern end. It's about nine miles, about a mile to two miles in between. That's traditional. Conrad Weiser Jr. says something a little different. 
says from north to south, closest to Schenectady to south. Niskensdorf, everybody agrees. Uh, Gerlachsdorf, everybody agrees. Foxesdorf, everybody agrees. Schmidtsdorf, everybody agrees. Then he says Weisers or Brunendorf. Then he says Hartmannsdorf. And again, heading south, then he says Oberweisersdorf. Weisersdorf is the first place that they go to because Brunendorf became the name later on perpetuated in England as Fountain Town. That was the name that stuck. The first name, if it's the first name, that doesn't stick. Weisersdorf becomes that uh, first settlement. And uh, over Weisersdorf is very interesting. I believe that Johann Conrad Weiser stayed in Schenectady until almost as late as 1714. It's not that he didn't come down and stay here and there. Uh, I'm sure he commuted. But for the most part, he didn't actually settle until probably about late 1714. And his son, Conrad Jr., does probably also doesn't join him until that time. And this dorp was settled in the fall of 1712. Um, I go into this quite a bit more in the book, but I want to give you an idea that Brunendorf was known as Weisersdorf first. Ober Weisersdorf is very uh, interesting. Uh, any of you speak German? Maybe a little. Okay. Ober is usually used for upper, okay, which is the upper part of the valley. Makes sense. So Harry Creek runs from south to north. So it's actually in the upper part of the valley as the last settlement. It's also the last one before the Mohawk Village, which there were two in the valley, consolidated around, uh, around 1713 or 14. Um, so Ober is upper, but it's also used as sort of like a rank. So if you're a senior something, doesn't matter what, military or civilian, if you're a mayor, if you're a uh, magistrate, which Johann Conrad Weiser was, um, you might use Ober Weiser to give him a little bit more importance as being an upper, almost an upper class. Um, so Ober is a very interesting word. It is specific to Johann Conrad Weiser. <clears throat> And this is just one place you can visit in Schoharie, where that Brunendorf is. This is just a 1743 parsonage that is still there as a museum. So it's a little piece of the old country, um, a Fleur Cooking House. Do you know what a Fleur Cooking House is? Maybe, maybe we will have a test afterwards. No, that's okay. A Fleur Cooking House is a hall kitchen house. It's a small uh, kitchen area, about one third. It's about uh, two thirds is the stew or the living area. <clears throat> which is a large have a uh, root cellar that is the house is built on the uh, in the hillside on purpose so that the cellar you enter it is a root cellar you you know grow whatever roots or tubers you want it's a good place to store things and in the lofts you might might have children um, or others or they might be living with the parents in the in the main room uh, but it's also where you're going to put your dried fruits and vegetables up in the rafters. Uh, heading into fall. So you have that for the winter. But anyway, um, that is a dominant style of house in the Scoheri Valley and also Mohawk Valley prior to the revolution. And this is a, an example of where these dwarfs, according to Johann Conrad Weiser, or not Johann, but Conrad Weiser Jr. And the way I also believe them to be, um, instead of the first, um, the first um, settlement being in what is now Middleburg, that's probably the last settlement. Um, I go into this quite a bit in the book, but needless to say, what Johann Conrad Weiser wanted to do was be at the head of all things with the Mohawks, which he could have been at the first Weisers or Brunendorf because where that little place called Eskaher, north of right here, north of Fox Creek and Fuchsdorf, um, that consolidated with the other Mohawk village south of Middleburg known later as Wilder the Hook by the Dutch. So once they all moved there, obviously Weiser wanted to be right there so he could be at the head of all diplomacy. So no matter what happens, everybody had to go through him. He's basically setting himself up to be a governor of a colony. Now, some other things that may be of interest here. Um, Adam Broman uh, gets a patent just south of... Uh, of uh, Oberweiser's Dorf here. Uh, this 
right here, Minard Schuyler and other partners bought the land right out from under the Palatines in 1714, late in 1714, after the Palatines said they will not rent, buy, or leave. Uh, they said they're going to stay, and we're just going to stay here. Uh, Governor Hunter sold this uh, land out from under him because he wanted money. One, he gets a cut. It's 18th century legal bribery. It's the way it works. Um, but he sold the land out from under him, and this is where the problems begin because the only people who are not Palatines and Mohawks in the Scoheri Valley is Adam Broman. The partners are in Albany. They can't get their hands on him. The problem is Adam Broman being there, the uh, Wiser and other Palatines looked at him as a spy. They turned him into a spy after uh, Johann Conrad Wiser had his son, Conrad and others, drag Adam Broman's sons off wagons, beat them, tear down his house um, <clears throat> after he um, uh, sows his wheat or other grains or corn. Um, Weiser would have livestock run over it. Uh, and then Weiser Jr., Conrad, would go to the local Mohawks and start telling them what his father wanted him to tell them. And that is that they're being, uh, <clears throat> that Adam Broman is cheating them out of land. This is a big deal, that Adam Broman was cheating them out of land. Um, very quickly, he was not. He had about a 600-acre uh, patent when two of them were put together by 1714. Uh, it was never surveyed properly. Um, so with an Indian deed, when they mark off where the land is before you get a patent, you have to satisfy the native proprietors. So they go, this landmark, that landmark, that landmark, this landmark. That's all they do. However many acres it is, it is. But it was never surveyed properly. So the Wisers were able to use this to draw a wedge between Adam Froman, who had survived the Schenectady Massacre in 1690, went to Canada to get one of his sons who was captured. This is a guy that does not back down easily. But in order to get the Mohawks against him, even though they were friendly, basically living on his land, um, that they sold to him. Um, what happens is that the real fraud is Adam Froman's on the property. When it was finally surveyed at 1,100 acres, um, what happens is you have to pay a quit rent. You know how Bayard had an otter skin for like 30, 40 miles worth of stuff? It's two shillings and six pence for every 50 acres. So whatever he had above 600 acres, he was only paying tax, essentially taxes on 600 acres, not 1,100. So if there's any fraud, it's there. It's not against the Mohawks. Later on, the Mohawks even said so when Adam Broman bought the land again and made another deed and went through a patent for the whole 1,100 acres. They got paid twice. They were happy as a happy as anything, right? Uh, so anyway, um, Adam Broman, they have all kinds of problems. A posse is uh, sent out. Uh, they look for Johann Conrad Weiser. He's not in the area. So they leave. They send another uh, posse looking for him. They leave. The arrest warrant goes out for him. But in the meantime, the partners, the landowners now, they send a... Um, a guy by the name of uh, Adams. Local history tells you it's a Sheriff Adams. There was no Sheriff Adams in all of New York uh, during the colonial period, none. So I might've been a hired soldier or something. I, I could speak low Dutch or high Dutch, high Dutch speak German, low Dutch speak Holland, um, uh, well enough to be able to communicate with folks. So they, he, sends, uh, he gets sent down to Oberweisersdorf which later just becomes Weiser's Dwarf. So they set up the Oberweiser's Dwarf, and the idea is that, <clears throat> this is a view of the Onatagarawa, by the way, very prominent mountain. This is a view from Middleburg where the um, Oberweiser's Dwarf would be. This is one of the views they would have. So this uh, person, Adams, gets sent out, and usually you're supposed to tax something on a public building. There were no public buildings, uh, very crude shelters at best. All the men were out in the fields, the women were at home. So when this person shows up on horseback, the women come out and wonder what he's doing here. Now, just picture these women <clears throat> losing children and relatives in Germany, losing children and relatives and friends along the way from Germany, all, or what is now Germany, all the way all across the Atlantic into the camps. They're losing children, losing uh, friends, family, neighbors, all along the way. And here's this guy that tells them, you need to rent, buy, or leave. This is probably the second, third, fourth time that they're told to do this. They don't want to go anywhere. You can understand what happens next. They drag him off the horse. 
ride them on a rail, drag them through every mud hole and every pigsty for a good five or six miles to the end of the settlements for that second or that uh, trail at that time that went through the Heldebergs to Albany, brought them to a little uh, bridge that was set up on a creek and they broke a couple of his ribs. And the uh, leader of this group was Magdalena Z, poked an eye out, squatted over him and relieved herself in the eye socket. This is how angry these women were. Magdalena, by the way, it appears she lost two children along the way. You can see why they're upset right now, right? They're not, they don't want to move. So <clears throat> this, this uh, Adams, he lives, he crawls over the Heldebergs and gets picked up to Albany. Um, for a couple of years, things are pretty quiet um, until a larger group goes to Albany. Now the women went to Albany to get salt and other things that are necessary. Women are the ones who did the damage with that. The men didn't want to go because they were scared. I should tell you about the Palatine women, right? They're not afraid of much. Not afraid of much at all. They've had enough of this. So when this larger group, including Magdalene Z and Conrad Weiser uh, Jr., they get thrown in prison. And it kind of looks like what happens is some of these folks, in order to get out, they signed leases that allowed them to stay for 10 years, according to uh, Governor Hunter later in his defense of what happened. Um, <clears throat> the uh, lease that was offered was 10 years. You didn't have to pay anything. After that, you're paying two shillings and sixpence um, rent to the, um, to the partners um, only after 10 years. So they had a great deal. And it looks like Conrad Weiser Jupiter took up on that offer. That's why he left later than everybody else. Um, so I wanna go over a little bit with uh, Adam Broman. He's kind of an interesting guy. Uh, he lived right at the base of this iconic hill, um, glacially sculpted. <clears throat> the old Bowery, it's hard to see. Uh, but what it does here is kind of show where the, where the Indian village was, which was down here. There used to be an oxbow here that's no longer there, except for a stand of trees. Indian village over here, they're barely a ground over here. And he just kind of, you know, plots out in colonial fashion, he, he uh, breaks up, starts breaking up his patent in order to give to nephews and sons and son-in-laws because he can't legally give it to uh, his daughters. Something here, though, is uh, Tara Gadante comes into the story. He's looked at as, I look at him as the first uh, to return after 100 years, uh, Mohawks. Um, and he was living nearby to Groman. And this is the proof that he actually existed instead of the secondary sources. Terry Godonke, as they call it, his house was a certain distance away from one of those uh, um, land uh, parcels. Uh, so that's kind of cool. They also talk about the stump near his house, which in tradition and folklore says not only did the Mohawks use this stump with a wooden pestle, it was a huge stump, um, so did the Palatines at first. And it was also the high water mark of the flooding, um, so which was frequent. So that's a kind of an interesting find in the uh, uh, Roman papers. And this gives you an idea about the Mohawk village. Now the Mohawks, of course, and Conrad Weiser Jr. are like this. You know, they are, what Weiser understands is their culture, how they operate, how to talk to them, uh, things that if they were, if he was interpreting for somebody else, he might want to, he may want to diffuse a little bit if it's not, if it's not said properly, that might trigger somebody. Um, so he was smart enough to do this, even at a young age. So when we talk about the Mohawk village and their situation, um, this is who Conrad Weiser felt closest to, the junior. Didn't like his mother-in-law. If anybody read his memoirs knows. Did not like his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law did not like him. Um, so these were probably his closest confidants. But he was, as he always said, he was always his father's son, which means he would do anything he, he needed to do with him. And just so you know, this is uh, the second complaint from Adam Groman about Johann Conrad Weiser and others. Um, it actually exists. The stuff did help. And he actually talks about the house being torn down, sons being beaten. And that's what draws out um, the posses. <clears throat> okay, now, <clears throat> because of these problems, and Johann Conrad Weiser was uh, belligerent, 
He, he had a belligerent group around him. It wasn't all Palatines who were in the Schoharie Valley. Uh, Adam Broman was able to go around and talk to some of these Palatines, and not everyone agreed with Weiser with what he was doing. Now, these are all the farmer class out here. Uh, they might have picked up other trades, but they're all the farmer class. Uh, but Johann Conrad Weiser actually threatened some of these other, other Palatines that if they don't go along with what he says or he gives them trouble, that he's going to burn their houses. So factions begin. Factions start. And <clears throat> three men are sent to England, Johann Conrad Weiser, William Chess, and uh, uh, William Waldrat. They're sent to England. Uh, they leave about 1718 or so. They go to England. <clears throat> and while they're waiting for their chance to talk to either the king or, or uh, the board of trade, which is actually running the colonies, um, <clears throat> they run up debts that they can't pay. So bill comes due. They're thrown in a Tower of London. And once they finally get money from uh, Schoharie folks and probably others, <clears throat> then they finally have their time with uh, the Board of Trade. And <clears throat> they say, well, you know, we'd like to stay in Schoharie if we can. That wasn't an option. They had already burned that bridge because of all these things that were happening. That word got to them. But they did get a little bit of a sympath sympathetic ear. And <clears throat> Johann Conrad Weiser, being the belligerent one, once he found out that he couldn't get what he wanted, he started trying to make a private deal for other land uh, that may or may not have been the Tulpehocken area. Uh, but William Sheffs is the one that tells us about the Schoharie region a lot. And this is documented. It's not secondary. Where they had mills, they had nice homes. They talk about the two roads, which one came first, which one came second. And the general disposition of the people, how well their houses were. They were the envy of Albany because by that time, they were all, their fields were already better than anybody else's. German industry, great farming techniques, efficient farming techniques, built on speed and efficiency. So while they were out there, Johann Conrad Weiser had not come back yet. Chefs came back and said, look, we couldn't get what we wanted. But Governor Hunter changed places with somebody in the Treasury named William Burnett. William Burnett becomes the governor, and his instructions were, Pretty sympathetic to the Palatines. If they wanted to stay in New York, find them a place to go. They just can't stay in the Scoberry Valley. The land has already been sold. And there may or may not have been some misstatements about when that land was sold, about who came first. Um, so Shes uh, comes back, tells the folks in Scoberry, they know that they can't do anything. Uh, but in 1722, they have a meeting with Governor Burnett. Uh, including Johann Conrad Weiser, uh, I'm sorry, uh, not him, but uh, Conrad Weiser Jr. And they find out, oh, wait a minute, Governor Keith from Pennsylvania is in Albany. And he starts talking about out, you know, out in Pennsylvania with Copahawken. And he invites them out there. This is a true invitation to go out there. Um, so in the, in, the, in the spring of 1723, <clears throat> 15 or 16 families decide to go to the Tulpehocken region. And they're going to go down to Susquehanna. Now, this particular map was uh, made in 1778 uh, by a map maker uh, of the Continental Army that was in the Scoharie area. Now, what's important here is they name where the canoe place is. It's right here. So this is this is the Scoharie um, Valley. This is what a lake called Summit Lake. Uh, it's near the center more or less of Scoharie County. And uh, there's a creek from called the Charlotte Creek that goes more or less from there all the way to the Susquehanna, which is here. This is known as this canoe place. This is the canoe place that others talk about uh, locally. So this is where uh, those 15 or 16 families, more than likely helped by others, uh, made dugout canoes where you just take a trunk of a tree and you just burn very carefully with charcoal layers upon layers upon layers down so that you can sit in it. And that those are the canoes that they took down here. Uh, this is the first um, uh, time that they come down. I count at least four different times. Some may have taken the Susquehanna. Some may have taken the Delaware um, from what is what you can see. And most people try to make it the first one so they confuse themselves all the time. 15 or 16 show up in the Topolhocken area, 1723. By 1727, there's over 80 families that can trace themselves back to the Squarey Valley, whether they were original settlers there or people are going through 
with different uh, ships that came from New York City and Philadelphia. It's hard to determine, but they came through the Schoharie Valley. And of course, they end up here. This is where you folks are very familiar with, uh, with Berks County. Um, and you have, uh, you know, the Tulpehocken region, Wolvelsdorf, where Conrad Weiser Jr. eventually sends up. Uh, but before this happens, the ball is already in play uh, with Governor Burnett. And he's going to get land out the German flats up here. This is the Skoheri uh, Valley here, the, uh, some of the doors as they are shown here by a different person with different ideas about the doors. But the doors are here. Um, this is the way that Governor Bur Burnett approached it. He said, we'll find you land. And he talked to first those group, that group that Adam Roman found very um, um, uh, approachable and agreeable. Those are the ones that were being threatened. So there were really two groups that were here, the threatened ones and the belligerent ones. Belligerent ones are the ones that went down to Topahawken. If you guys have high-spirited people, it's probably because of these folks. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just that they had just had enough. They want their own promised land. Um, so anyway, um, Governor Burnett approaches it this way. He talks to the group, and there's a certain group that's still kind of a, a little bit belligerent. But they don't want to leave New York necessarily. He says, we'll get you land up, up in Little Falls, which later became known as the German Flats up here. Um, just, you know, let me know what you want to do. I'll get it for you. Very simple. And, you know, it was suggested about a certain area. And um, at first they were agreeable. So, all right, that's great. But then they started hemming and hawing. This is another case where there's charity here, but they're kind of thumbing their nose at it. So this is what Burnett does. He says, all right, I'll talk to the other folks, the ones that are really agreeable. This is how I'm going to approach it. I'm going to tell them to get any land they want on the Mohawk Valley. It can't be bottom land. That's the only thing. It can't be bottom land. So what do they do? They choose their own land. Not that they're going to get, get, be giving it to them. They're going to choose their own land right here in Stone Arabia. And the idea worked for a time. It made the others go, wait a minute, we play ball. We can get something really nice. But in the end, about 27 families go to Stone Arabia. Only three or four go to German Flats. Uh, the rest of them either stay in Schoharie and rent by, rent or buy through the partners, or they end up going to Topak or, or in that region. Um, now, <clears throat> something that happens, well, what happens back in Schoharie after these folks leave? Well, they have a little block church where um, the Lutherans and the uh, Dutch Reformed, which are most of these Palatines, um, or I should say German Reform, uh, where they go. So they're sharing a building. And it's said by one of the uh, Lutheran pastors that um, he lamented the fact that the Lutherans had left this to the Dutch Reformed. Little, you know, just a little bit of a dig on them. Uh, so the Schoharie Valley by about 1750, I just want to show you a King's Highway uh, that ran through it, the places we're talking about. Uh, this is over Weisersdorf, later just Weisersdorf or town. The Vroman land is here. Uh, there is a uh, Mohawk village here. Uh, this is the lower part uh, where the Old Stone Fort is. If anybody's ever heard about Schoharie Valley, might have heard about the Old Stone Fort. So the lower part is this way, upper part is this way. Um, and by 1729, Conrad Weiser Jr. Now, something about Conrad Weiser, I told you he was, um, he had um, done everything his father had done. Well, when his father went to England, he stayed there for quite a while, um, right through 1723, I think right into 1724. And he actually had an interview with the Palatine, oh, not the Palatine, but the Penn family. William Penn had already died, and he had his interview with him, and he asked about land that eventually became part of the Delaware uh, Water Gap. And he asked about it. Nothing was given to him. Nothing was done. But he started using that visit as a way to get introduced to people in Philadelphia in order to sell land around the Delaware Water Gap. So he was kind of scheming. Um, this is the father scheming at the time when Conrad Weiser Jr., with all these moves in 1723 to Tulpehawk, Stone Arabia, German Flats, he was there at each step of the way negotiating what would be settled with the, with the Mohawk proprietors um, for the land. He was there, and he probably, I believe, helped uh, make the canoes. 
Here's a, Conrad Weiser Jr. who ends up here um, later. He's atoning for what his father was doing. It's basically what he was doing. And he was making it good with everybody, not just the ones who were his father's real followers, but all the other ones who wanted a, a new place to go. So he stuck around long enough in order to make this happen. Um, so there's a great amount of credit for him. What happens is when his father's out, he gets married in 1720. Married man, a little different perspective in life, starts having children, but also he matures. He knows what he did wrong, and he tries to make it right uh, before he leaves. So in 1729, here's the Schoharie Valley here. By 1729, he's up here and buys land, um, and Hartman Windecker, who was a friend of uh, his father's, uh, also bought land up here. And it's hard to say whether or not he bought land for himself or his father, but his father's whereabouts throughout this is very vague at best. Uh, about the only thing anybody said was he was on the border of New England, which could mean New York, the Hudson Valley, could mean the Mohawk Valley. Somebody not familiar with New York might say something like that. Um, so he buys land up here, but doesn't really stay because by 1731, Got to move forward. By 1731, this is a very familiar site to everybody, I'm sure. Uh, it's a beautiful homestead. Um, and he ends up on this site where, of course, he meets Shekelemi. He creates this huge, uh, just great, fantastic relationship with Shekelemi and other uh, Delaware and other leaders of uh, Shekelemi's Oneida, but also Delaware leaders. And he becomes the interpreter for Pennsylvania. Um, where he was always trying to tell the truth. But one thing he did do, he learned very easy, very early on, is to make sure that what he's telling the, the Mohawks or whoever else he's dealing with kind of takes what, you know, the governor or whoever, whatever official says, it kind of makes it palatable. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like, you know, sometimes they would be very crude and quite frankly, disrespectful. Conrad Weiser was one of those folks that was smart enough to know there's a bigger picture here. And I might want to shade a couple of things here to make sure that it doesn't cause a rift that you can't get over. So not only was it an interpreter, he was a diplomat at the same time. And uh, to, to, to close, um, <clears throat> you don't know these folks, but I can tell you I know these folks, and they are uh, just the, the salt of the earth as far as I'm concerned. This is Roger on the left and his brother Mike. They are Mohawk. Uh, come down to the Spahiri Valley. And they have an interesting story, which I have in an epilogue in the, in the volume three. Now, the Palatines left war and famine and all these things um, from uh, Europe came eventually to Spahiri. Some of them came here. Some of them went to the Mohawk Valley. Some stayed in the Spahiri Valley. Now what we have are folks from uh, Mohawks from Akwesasne who are fighting a different war, an environmental war who are now own land in the Schoharie Valley again um, and are rematriating a part of that land where their old village was. So this is uh, about nine years ago, they were singing a, uh, a song uh, that is to raise the warrior spirit to protect the Schoharie Valley again. Uh, so it's very interesting that those two things come full circle because 300 years later, now the Mohawks could use, use help instead of the Palatines using help. And the Mohawks are the ones who not only helped them through that first winter, but throughout, they became good friends, uh, showing them where to hunt, how to hunt, what to do, uh, sharing food that they probably could not afford to share, uh, but also got them through the toughest time. Uh, so now it's come full circle. So it's kind of an interesting story. And really what it was with Conrad Weiser Jr. and the Mohawks, this is a, called the two row wampum belt. It's where um, two canoes are going down a river, one has the European um, in one canoe with all their stuff, all their laws in it. And they're going along in the Haudenosaunee going on the other uh, canoe with all their laws and everything else. And everything will be fine as long as they paddle together down the stream, but don't cross and tell each other what to do. And this is the world that Conrad Weiser Jr. learned. And that's what I've got. So uh, are there questions?